Good evening, and welcome to the Utah Growth Summit. Utah is experiencing remarkable prosperity. This means that we have more jobs and better jobs. It means that our children will no longer have to leave the state to find employment. It means more tax dollars to improve our education system and to address other priorities. But growth also brings other problems. With citizens' input, state and local leaders have prepared proposals to reduce traffic congestion and preserve open spaces and protecting our water supplies. Now we need your reaction to these proposals. In addition, I hope each one of you tonight will ask yourself a very important question. What can I do? Now there's a time in the life of every problem when it's big enough to see but still small enough to solve. Tonight as a state, we begin the process of preserving our quality of life during a period of unparalleled opportunity. Our moderator this evening is Ed Fooey of the Pew Center for Civic Journalism in Washington, D.C. Ed? Thank you, Governor. What we're engaged in... What we're engaged in here tonight is an unprecedented exercise in civic journalism. It's an effort to involve citizens in the decisions that have to be made in a democracy because we all have a role to play. This program is being carried on all major commercial and public television stations in the state and on many radio stations. Major newspapers have carried extensive coverage of these growth issues which we'll be discussing tonight. But now it's time for you, the people gathered here and in your homes around the state to carry on this debate about Utah's future. Gathered with us are spokesmen from the three working groups who wrote the proposals for solving some of these growth problems. We have State House Speaker Mel Brown, Senate President Lane Beatty, both Republicans, Governor Mike Levitt. Speaking for all of the state's local governments, we have Toby Ross of the Utah League of Cities and Towns and Gail Stevenson of the Utah Association of Counties. House Minority Leader Frank Pignanelli and Scott Howell, Senate Minority Leader, both are Democrats. The first of the three issues that we'll be examining tonight is transportation. If you've ever been stuck in a traffic jam, and who hasn't, this is an issue that hits home in the driver's seat. Here's a look at the problem from reporter Rod Decker. Wasatch front roads are stuffed. More people live along the front, and each person travels more. But the changes have been unbelievable the last Last year, year and a half, two years, it's getting worse fast, and I think it's just going to continue. In 1960, the average Wasatch Front resident traveled 7.8 miles a day. By 1985, that had about doubled to 15.8 miles. And by 2005, it will rise again to 17.6 travel miles for each person each day. And congestion is up even more than traffic. Just ask commuter Clyde Ofinger, who lives in Sandy. As you add cars now, with the freeway so full, the problem's just going to multiply. Now, with great fanfare, politicians at the Capitol say they'll build more roads, notably a $1 billion addition of four lanes to I-15 down the middle of Salt Lake Valley. Big question is how to pay for it. Transportation Director Tom Warren says the federal government, which built the interstates, will not pay for this project. I think it would be unwise to count on a lot of federal money for the I-15 corridor. Is what we're hearing, we may get, we won't get very much and we may not get any. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? I would say that's probably true. Traditionally, Utahns have paid for roads with gas tax. But politicians say they can put off any tax hike because they have a big surplus of money at the Capitol. And they plan to use that surplus for roads instead of for schools, colleges, or other programs. And besides, they may change the way gas tax is divided up. Now, for every dollar of gas tax paid in Salt Lake County, only 49 cents is spent on roads in Salt Lake County. In Davis County, only 41 cents goes for roads in Davis County. The rest goes to rural Utah. To improve urban roads, Wasatch Front counties will have to keep more of the gas tax they pay. More roads mean more cars and more pollution. 
Now, plans call for a light rail, like this one in Portland, down the middle of the Salt Lake Valley. That would reduce the number of cars and pollution a little bit. The federal government will pay most of the cost, but a lot of Utahns still don't want it. Politicians will have to decide whether to build light rail. Here at the Wasatch Front Regional Council, a computer program shows that if Utahns build new freeway lanes and the light rail, congestion will get just a little worse. That high growth southwest seems to be the biggest of the problems. But if nothing is done, traffic will become impassable. You're looking at a congested freeway 12, 14 hours a day that you will go out on that and in the stop and go almost all the time. The Wasatch Front is growing too big for its roads, and it must run faster and faster just to stay in the same place. There are several proposals to deal with this congestion in addition to light rail. My colleague uh, Randy Ripplinger is here to help with the audience questions. Let's get an eyeball estimate. How many of the people here would ride light rail? Okay. Taking a look at it, Ed, it looks like, oh, maybe a third or a quarter if we're lucky. Let's ask a couple of other questions if you're interested in other modes of getting to work beside your car. How about carpooling? How many of you currently carpool to work regularly? Very small percentage on that one. All right, let's try buses. How many of you currently ride the bus? Eh, about the same, maybe a little more. If the bus system were improved, how many of you would ride the bus? Maybe 20%. Uh, so I don't know if we add them all together, we might be getting close to half of the people. Would choose some other mode, Ed. Okay, here's how people around the state responded to our survey taken two weeks ago by Insight Research and Dan Jones and Associates. About half said they would not use carpools, light rail, or better bus service. The pollsters interviewed 1,200 citizens, and we'll use those results throughout the evening. Okay, Randy, let's begin the dialogue. Who do you have there with a question or a comment for our panel? Ed Eldon Christensen is here from Salt Lake City and has a question particularly about I-5 versus light rail, Eldon. Yeah. How do you propose to get people to, to ride the light rail? It seems to me that uh, the cost and convenience of cars overwhelms the light rail and people will continue to ride in their cars. It seems to me like we'll spend a lot of money for uh, a uh, to serve only a few people. Why don't we spend the money expanding I-15 and I-215 and other roads? Okay. Senator Beatty, you want to take a crack at that? Well, first of all, the, the issue of light rail has been kind of uh, focused just in the Salt Lake County area at the present time. Light rail has not been a discussion point of, of the uh, groups that have been together, whether we ought to have it or not. What we've tried to concentrate on is do we need some form of mass transit? And that's the issue that seems to be continuing to come up. And except for much broader, they try to look at a space uh, between uh, Weber County and Utah County. And the discussions as to what is going to be the best method of mass transit really has not taken place as far as the legislature is concerned yet. OK. Anybody else want to add to that? Senator. Thank you. Uh, you raise a very good question about how we out in the West who are so independent can give up our independency. And it's, it's a simple fact that gridlock will cause us to start to look at ways of moving from A to B. There are certainly many more answers other than just light rail. I lived in Atlanta for about five years, and down there we had MARTA. It's a combination light rail, monorail type of mass transportation. I recently talked with some of my friends who lived out in East Cobb where the MARTA had just gotten there. Uh, in the last six months, and they are taking it now. And the reason they are is because there's no other way of transportation that can get them effectively and efficiently from point A to B. And the other thing that I think we need to remember first and foremost in this whole debate about light rail and mass transportation, it's an air pollution problem. We're talking about the environment. We're not talking about the transportation as much as we are the environment and the pollutants that come. So there's a broader issue there than just light rail. I'm not sure what the mass transportation is, but I agree with Senator Beatty that we have to do something to keep our environment safe and clean so you can breathe. A lot of common ground on that issue. Randy, do you have a question? We have another follow-up question. On a slightly different twist, everybody's talked about I-15, light rail. Michelle Savage is here from Salt Lake City. Uh, what, uh, what is the, the problem that you're seeing with what we're talking about here? 
One of the problems that I notice is the, is the inability to travel throughout the city because of con the constant congestion within the city streets, the inner city streets. I would like to know what are your short-term and long-term plans for adjusting and correcting the infrastructure in Salt Lake City? Specifically road congestion, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Governor, you want to swing at that one? Because we're having a statewide summit, let me deal with that more generically and then perhaps deal uh, directly. Uh, the primary focus of the plans that have been placed on the table is that we're going to build roads in a lot of them. We're proposing a roughly three and a half billion dollar transportation budget to build roads over the next, just for building over the next uh, uh, 10 years. In addition to that, we expect that the local governments will have additional revenues that they can use to unclog congestion in their areas. You, you don't have to go out on the freeway to see it. If you go to 21st South and 7th East, you'll back up for three blocks on the on the way. So we, the legislature will be first of all proposing a substantial budget, three and a half billion over 10 years, at least the, the one working group that one proposal. And the second thing we'll be doing is providing more money for local governments to work on local needs. Now there's some disagreement on how that should be done. One would divide up the, the, sales ta the uh, fuel tax a little differently. Another proposal would cut state taxes and allow local taxes to be raised to make it up and so they can make their own decisions. Local government, do you want to, either one of you want to uh... You're both here to represent local government. Let's Absolutely. hear from you. Toby Ross. Most of the roads in the state are the responsibility of local government to maintain. And our concern is that uh, today, most local jurisdictions are using their general revenues that could be otherwise used for police or fire protection or libraries or open space to build roads. And we were looking at a program that would enhance the transportation fund um, substantially increasing it and also giving local government a share of that new money. Frank Pignanelli. Yes, Ed, and the question's a good one. I represent downtown Salt Lake City and I understand why it's so frustrating. We talk about all the major roads but then they're dumped into the cities whether it's Salt Lake or someplace else and there's congestion. There's a lot of proposals that have been, out, been through the growth summit but one of the things that we've recommended is a metropolitan transportation authority that would look at an integration of both what's happening in the major state roads and the other roads that are impacted. Secondly, the state's got to do a better job of working with local government, as each gentleman just said, to provide not only greater funding, but at the same time give them more tools for flexibility. Because far too often we've said, let's build the big roads, and then we begin to ignore the problems of the smaller roads that are being used to take people to their homes and to their businesses. Okay, let's move on to the next citizen question. All right, we can't hardly talk about transportation or any of these issues uh, without getting a little interrelated with others, one of them being open space. Come on up, if you would. Uh, we've got a question here that does relate to the open space and transportation. This is from Glenn McKee of Uinta County. I'll appreciate this opportunity, uh, <clears throat> Governor and panel. I'm Commissioner McKee, Uinta County. Uh, I had a fellow, Ed Gray, uh, from the Salt Lake Wasatch Front Area here, sent me this letter and requested that I read uh, parts of this. Should we just, just get to the substance of it for the paragraph here. Uh, we're concerned that the producing county that depletion in resources are alluding to a NAFTA about Canada I think we've lost uh, we've lost the microphone on that one. Are we back now? Okay, fine. Uh, for, for an example here, nineteen eighty five oil production in the Utah was 40,792,000 barrels. Today, uh, as of 1994, that's declined to $20,661,000. This letter indicates in their research that uh, the Utah refineries is uh, in dire need of in planning for pipeline, pipeline oil out of the, the Canadian Peninsula. How will that affect our transportation? Well, it, for one, as far as an economic aspect, this, this, this not only hurts all the rural producing counties, but it, it, it it'll also hurt the economy of the local area. Uh, so that, our problem is, is not related to transportation, but more of an economic situ dilemma that we don't know what, that we, need, that we hope that the panel and the governor will consider. Okay, thanks very much. Did you want to comment on that, Governor? He seems to be addressing it to you. Transportation clearly is a backbone for all commerce, oil industry, for example, unless they can move their product out and eff efficiently, trans or, or tourism is another. Uh, having good roads is an important part of, a, of a, any economy that either has minerals or tourism. Uh, you start looking at the infrastructure that's needed for a, for a community to, to uh, 
uh, prosper. Clearly, roads are part of that. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, has struck me in, in uh, doing the background research is the, the cost of um, rebuilding I-15. You all agree that it has to be rebuilt, right? There's no disagreement on that. But there is a difference on how to fund it, and it's about a billion dollars that we're talking about. Is that correct? I wonder if we could start with you, Speaker Brown, um, the Republican proposal for bearing that cost. Let me start off by saying that I believe we all agree is whether we expand the freeway system or whether we don't, we've got to rebuild the system. The system's old, it's worn out, it's, uh, it's in bad need of repair, and, uh, and it's time to, to make a decision. The decision has been made, and, and the best numbers that we've been able to come up with in this process is that a statewide transportation program over the next 10 years of approximately two and a half billion dollars. That's essentially focusing one billion, at least uh, on the, the I-15 corridor from uh, 6 north to 106 south. Uh, the, the, the plan which we believe uh, is a workable plan, uh, the state is enjoying very good economic conditions right now. And we believe that, uh, that we can divert uh, $75 million a year beginning with next year uh, and increase that as we go on uh, from the general fund budget to help subsidize that. Uh, we believe that we, uh, we can, uh, that'll generate over the period of the 10 years that we estimate about a billion of that two and a half billion dollars. We're looking at some increased efficiencies in the transportation department of uh, about a uh, hundred million dollars over that 10-year life. And then, of course, uh, another important aspect, which we believe is the indexing of our gas tax, because... Uh, Could you explain uh, what you mean by indexing of the gas tax? Sure. Just briefly. Uh, in 1988, I believe it was, the gas tax in the state was increased five cents. Since that time, because of the inflation factor, the actual usable or spendable dollars or real value of those dollars has decreased. And so now, instead of the tax generating approximately 19 cents per gallon in real usable dollars, it, it's decreased at least five cents. We believe it only makes sense now to, to, to come up and we believe we could index that against the inflation and, and perhaps some other factors that would uh, stabilize that, that uh, transportation fund and, and add to that contribution. I'm going to come to you because I know you're bursting to say something on that. But first, we, I wanted to show a, uh, just a bit of a, a graphic. We, in our polling, we, looked at, we asked people, what do you pay now in gasoline taxes? And a remarkably small number of people knew exactly what it was. Only 19 cents per gallon. About 9% of people knew uh, what they were paying for gasoline tax. All right, sir. Well, that's about... Midway, I've seen a chart at uh, Utah Foundation, it's in between. Uh, transportation in Utah and our planning for the last several decades has been crisis management, and that's wrong. And we commend the governor for putting together this growth summit. But the Democrats, we would hate to see what happens. The result of this growth summit was simply an increase in gas taxes, and that's what indexing is. I appreciate my colleague, Mel Brown, he's usually a man of few words, but indexing means increasing. And we think before, you increase the gas tax. There's other things that, we, that should be done. Number one is looking to the surplus. Number two, there's a lot of efficiencies that we can obtain out of the current transportation system. Three, there's a lot of bonding that we can do to help the, the rebuilding the I-15. Because if we're going to increase the gas tax, if that's eventually the determination made by the governor and legislature, then what we have to do then is shift the tax to someplace else. Working families should not have to bear the burden of this transportation problem. We need to go to other sources, first and foremost, and maximize those efficiencies. That is the hallmark of our transportation proposal. Governor? The proposal from the Republican side, and I'm pleased to know about the support of the Democratic side for that proposal as well, would, over the course of time, starting in 1998, increase by indexing about one cent a year until a sunset date, and then the legislature would have to revisit it. It's important to note, however, that the proposal also includes, including last year and the year before and this year, tax cuts of nearly $4 for every $1 of added income to the, highway, uh, to the highway fund. In other words, we intend to reduce taxes over the next 10 years, $4 
for every one dollar that we put into the into the gasoline tax fund. Now that's what that means is that we're we're actually able to put more dollars into highways and have less dollars going into other parts of government. Mr. Stevenson, your proposal was slightly different. Yes, the basic concern that has been expressed already is that in any management of the transportation problem that local needs are not ignored and I don't think that's the intention but because the half of all of the costs presently of local transportation is not borne by the state's 25 percent share it's borne by property tax the property tax cuts that have been given by the state do not necessarily reflect into local government and we have a problem with regard to that funding. Okay. Let's go to another question and uh, this will be the last in this sec section on transportation. It's back. Good. <laughs> Anytime we talk about taxes, we don't have any trouble getting a rise out of members of the public. And Mote Monga from Provo has a comment particularly about uh, the tax situation on gasoline. Yes, sir. Uh, I have been paying taxes here in Utah. And I want you guys to find some other way of funding this thing besides taxing. <laughs> you know, um, Uh, as you tax us on gas, then the gas guys will turn around and tax us citizens. If there is any possibility of any other things besides taxing, please help us citizens. We are here, we can help, but we can only pay so much taxes. Thank you. Senator Beatty, you want to answer that one? You bet. I'm very pleased with the question and the response because that was the response of almost all of the working groups. The very last thing that we want to do is implement tax increases. I hope that all of you know that some of the first things we talked about were some of the various methods whereby we could accomplish this by taking more people off of the roads, for instance, try to encourage businesses and other people to, to take away um, starting time so that they could start at different times. Some of the other issues that we talked about were trying to use our very, the efficiencies of our government. One of the concerns we've had with our local government is that we have state roads intermixed with city and county roads, and I mean within the same corridor on the same road, and, and we think we need to look at those kinds of efficiencies. The department alone came up with a substantial amount of money in efficiencies, cutting back from, from areas that they believe they can cut back on and put their money where their mouth has been to avoid that at all costs. And I, I, would, uh, I would think I would speak for most uh, of the legislature in saying that the tax increase, if it is necessary, would be the very last thing that we would look at. We would just hope that we'll get more input from the citizens as other ways we may be able to accomplish that. Does he speak for you, Senator Howell? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, let me just put it to you this way. It doesn't make good math to me that we continue to give back surplus dollars and turn around and say we're going to raise your gas tax. The math doesn't add up. It's time that the citizens of the state of Utah understand what's happening. It's called tax shifting. We have to come forward and we have to be better in the way we spend your money. You speak for many citizens, not only from Utah County but throughout the state. Major trucking companies, if we raise taxes, they'll move. We have to fix the problem, but we can't go in and say, we're going to cut your taxes, and then we're going to turn around and shift it by saying, we're going to raise your taxes. It doesn't add up. The math does simply not work. We have, we have to do a better job. OK. Uh, a quick comment. Uh, did you have one? There is no advantage in shifting from a gas tax to a property tax. That affects people, too. OK, fine. We're going to move on to the next topic which is water. Our next growth issue may not be as evident every day as traffic congestion is, but that's because you can still turn on the faucet and you have water. But our water supplies are not growing as fast as our population. Here's a closer look at the problem from reporter Bruce Lindsay. We drink it, we play in it. Mostly we pour it on the ground to grow plants and grasses and crops that nature never intended should survive. We forget, after all, that Utah is a desert. We're the second dry state in the nation behind Nevada, our neighbor to the west. 
Nevada receives about 9 inches, and we receive about 12 inches on the average. The very day Utah's first modern settlers arrived, they diverted the trickle of City Creek to irrigate their crops. Their towns sprang up on the west slopes of mountains near the mouths of canyons with dependable streams. Nothing happened in Utah without water. Water limited settlement in those early years. It could limit growth again. The new Micron plant, for example, will require an estimated 2,000 acre-feet of water per year. The plant will create 3,500 new jobs and more than twice as many additional support jobs. Each new job represents a new home that will use about one acre foot of water per year. So the impact from Micron alone, at least 13,000 acre feet of water demand. Each year, Utah's population increases by about 50,000. That means finding water for a brand new thirsty city the size of West Jordan every year. In order to provide for additional growth, we have to put in new, uh, uh, new facilities, new pipelines, reservoirs, pump stations. Uh, so it's uh, going to be an aggressive plan to put that together. While population will increase, the snowpack will not. The rivers and groundwater will not. But Utah's water needs will double in the next 40 years. How much water and time do we have? Current sources will become inadequate for Salt Lake County in only 20 years. In places like Washington County, water supply is projected to be a constraint to growth even earlier. By the year 2020, we will require as much as 500,000 acre-feet of new water delivery. That much water would fill seven more echo reservoirs. Assuming we can find it, the cost to build the systems to acquire, deliver, and dispose of that much water will reach $5 billion. Who will pay that bill? Not Uncle Sam. The Jordanelle Reservoir was the federal government's final big water project. That leaves us with tough choices. Should the state and local governments raise the billions through higher property taxes? Or should the money come strictly from higher water bills? And higher water bills for whom? Just new water users who create the critical demand? Or should we all have to pay? Conservation must be an important part of Utah's long-range water plans, but potential gains through conservation are insufficient to compensate for the impact of growth. And the irony is, conservation is expensive. The less water customers buy, the less revenue there is to develop new water supplies. It just won't work. Uh, you know, how, how can you give a people an incentive to, to save water when you need more money? As it has been since the earliest days, water is both the source and the limit of Utah's growth. I'm Bruce Lindsay. Mr. Ross, as uh, city manager of uh, Park City, one of the boom towns, uh, shouldn't developers bear a share in the, in, of the costs? I think that local government, and as I understand both the Republican and Democratic proposals, believe that users should pay for the growth and that growth should pay its own way should pay its own way in terms of impact fees, and it should pay its own way in terms of user fees. Any disagreement on that? There seem to be, again, a lot of common ground among the three proposals that user fees ought to pay for a lot of this. OK, fine. We'll go to a question on the floor. Randy? Part of the problem that people are wondering about, of course, is we're going to have to buy a new one of these before the show's over. You got, you got me back now? Yeah. Hello. Okay, while, while we're waiting for that, um, I wonder if we could talk just for a second about the, uh, the Colorado River water. Is, is it a good public policy to be diverting some of the revenue that is, is presently, or rather that it, the water that is not being used from the Colorado River uh, downstream, or should one, two, that one, be two, taken one, advantage of here in the state? One, two, one, two, Governor? This is a very important public policy discussion that's long overdue. Uh, we have a substantial amount of, of water that is currently running unappropriated down through the Colorado River into the states below us and being used for nothing, and we're being paid nothing for it. In other words, the value we have in that water is not being realized for the state. All of the working groups agreed that it's time for us to take a look at that asset and say, what are our options? Is, is an option for us to lease it on a long-term basis and then take the money we get from that water that we can't develop right now and use it to develop water that we can? We think that makes an enormous amount of sense, and I think this is a very important outcome of this growth summit. If the legislature takes that policy position, it'll be a historic one, and one that undoubtedly will have great controversy because other states disagree with that position and would feel threatened by it. 
but it's our asset, it's our water, it's being used downstream by states for nothing, and it's time we utilize it to, to develop water that we badly need. Okay, we may be able to come back to that if we have time. Let's go to a citizen question, though. Thanks, Ed. Sorry for the mic problem. Of course, one of the things that citizens are concerned with is what water? And I moved here 12 years ago from the western slope of Colorado and have lived through a couple boom cycles and water is always the issue. Um, recognizing that the Colorado Plateau has a finite amount of water, um, are we willing to acknowledge and recognize that our growth is also limited by that? I do not agree that it's um, just something that we have to tap into. It's already over-appropriated in many areas and our water is limited just naturally. Are you uh, directing that question to anyone in particular? No. Okay. Senator Howell, you want to take a swing at it? Well, uh, water is the lifeblood of this state, and the, the governor and I keep teasing each other back and forth. Uh, he has not owned up to this yet, but you, the audience, are responsible for the first step in conservation of our, uh, of our water. If it's the lifeblood of the state and it's going to keep our economy strong, then when are we willing to step up and start to use secondary water for our golf courses? When are we willing to step up and to have our yards in a natural state versus lawn? Now that's a hard, hard reality of this water issue, but we've got to start listening to what nature says about where we live. We live in the desert. It's a reality of life. The governor, I hope, will lead the way and have the mansion landscaped in natural sagebrush. <laughs> I think it would look appropriate for the rest of the citizens. Do you want to uh, talk to, to the landscaping problem, Governor? Well, what I would like to uh, comment on is the fact that we do, in, in this state, we, we use a lot of water. We like green lawns, and there's nothing wrong with that if we're taking care of it and if we're managing it well. Uh, we will have to start making conservation a part of our ethic in the future. Uh, we have a wonderful resource in our mountains. We gather water efficiently there. We've managed it well. But in the future, as we have more population, we won't have more water, and we're just going to have to make conservation part of that. But I'm confident our people will do well at it and that uh, we can make it part of our, of our ethic. Policymakers will likely be asking you to pay more for the water that you drink and use on your lawn. Our poll of 1,200 Utahns indicate that most people think their water rates are just about right, and no wonder. As government figures show, you pay the lowest water rates in the West in Utah. Indeed, far lower than water rates, far lower water rates than the national average. Suppose a new water project needs to be built to provide water to your area. Would those of you who are here in the auditorium favor raising taxes to pay for the project or charging higher water rates to those who use the water? Could we see a show of hands on that, please? Charging higher rates to the users. Pretty unanimous there. Okay, I, and I see the lady who is standing with you feels the same way. Randy? Check, check. People do feel that way. I, would you favor paying more for your water for what you do on your yard? I would, I, especially if, you, um, if we were ones that used a large quantity relative to other people. I think if you want to have the luxury of, of having a huge lawn and a swimming pool that requires a lot of water, then you must take the responsibility for paying for that extra water. But this I is, uh, let me introduce, first of all, Nancy Melling from the League of Women Voters. We're glad to have you here. Uh, so, so what do you do if the water rates go up? Are you going to keep pouring it on your yard? Well, no. I mean, that's a strong incentive to get people to try to be conserve water as much as possible. And I think that government has a responsibility to lead the way in trying to get people to conserve water, in spite of the fact that you will receive less water as people, or less financing, as well, people use less water, still water is a finite resource and we we will come to the end of being able to develop one way or another and we really need to have government leaders encourage us and I'm wondering why it is we say well we can still have our green lawns I think we need to start thinking about terms of well maybe we don't need such large lawns or maybe we don't need to water them as often and rates is the way to do it that's one of the ways one of the ways Frank Pignanelli what about that higher rates to conserve water you for it in our proposal, we said that those who use the water obviously should be paying a higher cost. One of the things that's also in our proposal is that every year experts, water experts get to give and uh, make recommendations. The Water Advisory Panel made a number of recommendations dealing with conservation and other things. We believe it's time that we start adopting those measures. There's been a lot of talk about water, and Scott jokes about it, but the governor and others, including lawmakers, we need to lead out and start changing the mindset about water. Because if we don't, we will dry up with, I think, the second or third most arid state in the country, and we treat water like it's 
candy. And so it begins with the governor, begins with us, that we need to start changing that mindset so that's appropriate, uh, appropriately. Secondly, we need to start listening to our experts in water and start adopting the proposals that we made. And we encourage the governor and the other lawmakers to adopt those in the 1996 session. Uh, I wonder, Speaker Brown, if you have a position on that that's, that's somewhat different from what we've just heard. Then I'm no. going to go to you, Governor, because it seemed to me he was challenging you in there. <laughs> no, I don't have a different position. I don't think there's any question that, that a graduated rate structure is, is the process that, that puts in place the ability to fund many of this uh, infrastructure needs in water. Uh, the, the question was asked by the first respondent, the, the lady who moved here from Colorado, though. I don't think we ever really answered her question. Let me just say that, that uh, we, have, we have a very, very good water laws in Utah. We've had a very effective water policy over time. The real key to our water future, I believe, is our ability to store the water that runs out of the mountains from our snowfall. And uh, obviously that will require uh, uh, the creation and, and uh, development of new storage projects. Uh, I believe the water resource is there. It will be expensive and will, be, uh, will take a lot of planning and effort. But I think we can address the needs far into the future if, in fact, we aggressively look at this problem. Okay, Governor, quick comment. I assume that uh, the reference is the fact that I'm the one who brought this issue up. It's never made any sense to me that we ought to pay for the development of new water by raising property taxes. Uh, people who use it ought to pay for it. And that's a, in, a, in many ways a new concept, but it makes great sense to me, and I'm pleased we're getting this issue on the table, and I think in the future that's the way we'll finance water. If you use more, you should pay more. Okay, our time, is, uh, our time is growing short. We have one more important issue to tackle, and that's land use. It was the wide open spaces of the West that attracted many people to live here in the first place. But now there are population pressures that make you wonder, are we losing the West that we won? Reporter Rod Jackson looks at what's at stake. Cattle drives, red rock vistas, the rugged beauty of the Uintas, scenes each and every Utah holds dear. Nowhere else in America can you abandon the hectic workplace for the tranquility of a canyon stroll the joy of a mountain hike, the thrill of a ski run in just a matter of minutes. It's a lifestyle that has put Utah on the map. It's a lifestyle in serious jeopardy. Well, I'm about the only one left up here. Lyman Bueller farms 40 acres in the shadow of Micron in northern Utah County. He once farmed nearly 100 acres. The cities all around me, they've, they've made us an island. Islands we've come to call open space. Okay. Islands that are already premium commodities. 50,000 people are moving into Utah each year. By July of 1994, our population had reached 1.9 million, a mark we weren't supposed to hit for another 16 years. They all need places to live and work. And those places, more often than not, are being carved out of Utah's farmland. West Layton onion farmer Rick Stevenson says at least once a week a developer comes by, offering up to $25,000 an acre for his land. It's hard to turn it down here because we can go buy better farms with less population in Tremont and, uh, and then, you know, north of here. Many don't turn down the offer. Since 1987, 300,000 acres of Utah farmland have been lost to development. That's an area equal to one-third of the state of Rhode Island. Many Utahns are fed up with the rate of that loss. A recent proposal to build almost 1,000 houses, condos, and hotel rooms on Flagstaff Mountain in Summit County prompted a huge turnout of angry, worried residents. Does Park City need this development? No. These developers found a way that they can make a ton of money. Park City doesn't need this development, and the impact on Park City is going to be huge. We need to start doing some of this preservation in some areas that are not experiencing that kind of pressure yet. Bingham was among 50 politicians, farmers, developers, and others who met recently to seek those tools of preservation. Their suggestions range from tax breaks to conservation easements to the outright sale of a farmer's development rights. Under that scenario, a farmer owns and farms his land, but he sells the right to develop the property to a state or a city-managed trust fund for cash. Such funds have already proved popular and effective in Illinois, Texas, Washington, and North Carolina. 
Whatever the solutions, they must come soon. Time is running out. We're still farming, but we're pretty much all in the real estate business, too, whether we want to be or not. It's going to happen, and there's not much we can do about it. I'm Rod Jackson, reporting. Okay, let's ask the audience, how would you feel if you were that farmer's neighbor, Farmer Bueller, the first one we heard for, and he sold his property? Randy, do you have someone uh, who wants to raise some, uh, some questions like that? Well, let me post this to you. If you had a nice lot of property, you would uh, you mind if the government asked you whether or not you should divide it or, or dictate it to you whether you should? Well, I think uh, as far as the government dictating what we can or cannot do, they do that already. In, in the, uh, from the standpoint that we have planning and zoning laws. And as long as those zoning laws conform to, or we conform to those zoning laws, so yeah, then yes, they can require us to do certain things with our property. I suspect there's some people who wouldn't agree with you, uh, particularly if you already own the land and, uh, and perhaps this lot, Ed, if I'm correct, uh, was of a certain size to be subdivided and then the rules changed. Well, I think there might, may be a broader question that I could ask back to the panel, and that is that one of the things that I see is that there are a lot of uh, situations where various cities and counties right now are requiring acre lots or half acre lots, and a lot of those turn into nothing but weed patches. Couldn't we instead consider planning and zoning that would allow for a higher density and uh, clustered housing so that in the uh, clustered housing situation. Okay, let's uh, ask Mr. Stevenson to tackle that one. Well, certainly uh, local governments agree with the many organizations that have actually proposed the, the way open space should be maintained. We all know we need open space. We need it for peace of mind. We need it for recreation. We need it for good agriculture. And all of those should be preserved. And it should be preserved at the local level we firmly believe that, it, as this gentleman indicated, that good planning and zoning is essential to the kind of organized and responsible growth that should occur. Now, it's true the state has, the locals may need some tools to do that. And the state controls the toolbox. And therefore, there's got to be a cooperative effort between local and state government in order to maintain that kind of integrity with personal private property rights that are not trampled on that's important and agriculture being maintained all for the benefit of all the citizens everyone agreed everybody nodded in agreement with you that it is a local issue but suppose it cuts across jurisdictional lines if you're going to create uh, a broad green space, it's going to cut through many jurisdictions, isn't it? It is, and we need uh, proper urban planning. We can go across jurisdictional Just lines. urban or more than that? It is. Each area would be different. Rural Utah would be vastly different than urban Utah in terms of that collaboration which is necessary with their neighbors. But it is a process that can be uh, developed. Governor Levitt? I flew uh, in an airplane to uh, Logan a couple of months ago, and I, there's a little frontage road that leads from the airport. And I drove a, through, and on both sides of me, there was a, 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 a meadow where there were some cattle grazing and geese and water running through it. On the other side, there were cattle. And I could see all the way to the mountains on the west. And it occurred to me what a remarkable, important, a remarkably important part of that community's texture and tone that open space was. But there was a subdivision down the road, and we need those because they're going to be housing our children. But I thought to myself, if, if we don't do something right now, we could have houses covering this all the way to the mountains in 25 years. Now, the rules here have to be we cannot abuse property rights. We have to honor the property rights of people who own property. And those decisions need to be done on a local basis. People in Logan ought to be making decisions on how things are handled in Logan, not those of us in the state capitol. But if we start now, and we define the rules, and we give local governments tools, and we provide means by which they can raise the finances necessary, then local decisions ought to be made that will preserve that openness that we have in our community today. This is a very important discussion that we're having, because we get one shot at this. If we miss it and we lose that openness, we'll never regain it. Mr. Pignanelli, did you want to pick up on that? Well, it's kind of interesting that in Utah we're talking about open space 
when you get outside the Wasatch Front, it is so open. In my opinion, in the opinion of the Democrats, this may be a test of success for the Growth Summit, because we all agree that we need to deal with water and roads, but how do you balance those interests? And in our proposal, we believe that a commission needs to be established to look at this, that obviously respects the private property rights, but at the same time empowers local governments. And that's probably been the most missing aspect of how state government has dealt with land management, and that's empowering local government to deal with these tools. The governor's right. We messed this up. There's no going back. We have a proud pioneer heritage. Whether you moved in the state two years ago, you've been here your whole life, it was the pioneers who had the vision to plan. It was the pioneers who said, we need to structure how our communities are built. We have ignored that for too long. If we're going to properly manage our land, provide for an agricultural base, but at the same time respect private property rights, we have to start thinking now. And if we haven't made those decisions by the end of the 1996 session, we will have abdicated our leadership. Those decisions need to be made now to set up the structure. To me, this is the most important aspect of the Growth Summit because of the most difficult questions. Okay, again, a lot of common ground. P pardon the pun. Randy, you have a, a question from a citizen? I'm always interested in who pays Todd Rupert from Woodland Hills. I've got a question for you. We talk about uh, water rights, development rights, but what about development responsibilities? At what point do we balance the responsibilities versus the rights of developing to ensure that uh, road resources, water resources, land resources are available before the development occurs? Do you want to tackle that one? And then I'm going to go to you, Senator. We had an interesting debate last year uh, at the legislature about whether local government could charge a developer the fees that are necessary to pay for public facilities required by that development. Uh, thanks to Governor Levitt and some of our support in the legislature, we actually developed a program that allows us to continue to do that. But it was in great jeopardy. The legislature looked at taking away those tools local government has to mandate and provide for quality development. And that's a concern that we always have. Senator Howell? Thank you. Ed, this is a real simple one in my mind. The governor is big on ending federalism and giving states rights. We as legislators have to give county and city rights. It's just that simple. What flows downstream should flow to the city and the counties, and that should be the bottom line. With regards to what your specific question was, one of the best presentations we uh, were able to participate in came from the Utah Home Builders Association, where they showed how architects can go into a subdivision, create open space, create that environment where trees can grow, where your kids can feel safe. I challenge the architects of the state of Utah, the citizens, to start to design subdivisions around an open space concept. Don't get government involved. Don't make us mandate it. You take the responsibility, and that's what we should do. Everyone in here should not be interested in a profit motive, but they should be interested in an open space. And I'll tell you, the Utah Home Builders gave a great presentation with that concept. I hope you'll do it. Senator Beatty, any comment on that? Well, I do. First of all, I should say that I am a developer, so I, I, I'd want people to understand that first. The suggestions that Senator Howe has made has been made by the development industry for a long, long time. One of the problems that we have, in all honesty, is that as we go to different city councils and so forth, because of the zoning laws, they don't allow that to take place, and they feel very strongly about their communities. One of the problems that we have is 38% of the state's populations are under the age of 17. One of the problems we have is that they grow up and want houses, and they want some place to live. And so we also have to take that into consideration. We have some cities that actually have, have, have zoned so that young people can never live in those communities. They don't want multiple family homes, duplexes, fourplexes. They don't want those in their communities at all. And so what they say is you ought to go to the next community. The problem that we have now is then the next community comes and says, can't you as a state basis make sure that this is equal? The concern always comes back to we have to have local autonomy but we also have to have local responsibility. We have to somehow find a way that we can house the very children that we all seem that we want to produce here. I think he uh, wound up about where you started with that question. Okay, one last question. And he left off right where we're going, that is going to the next community. Sherry Einfeld from Kaysville. Governor Levitt has suggested that we ought to steer some of the growth toward the rural areas of Utah that really need and want the growth. And I think this is wise. What can be done on the state and local level to encourage this kind of migration? Governor? 
Well, there are many things. The first part we talked earlier, and that's we've got to have infrastructure, both the infrastructure of the current day and also the infrastructure of the future, being able to bring telecommunications technology, for example. One of the wonderful assets of this state is the un unmatched quality of life that exists in rural Utah. And there will be, I believe, a higher and higher premium put on that quality. Places you can walk up on the first green uh, tee and get a tea time when you want to, and you can walk to church and leave your door open if you want to because it's safe. Industries will find their way to rural Utah when we've been able to provide the job training, the roads, the telecommunications, and we will. Uh, things such as, such as investment strategies on tax dollars where we can give investment zones or, or uh, tax incentive zones where business can go there. We need to give incentives to local government or to businesses in Utah to relocate there. We need to actually look at uh, placing some governmental functions there. I mean, we literally could do governmental functions in those rural communities that we now just exclusively look at the, at the Wasatch Front. Uh, this is a wonderful asset we have, and I believe people will be drawn to it in the future. Well, Governor, as you said at the beginning of this broadcast, our quality of, of life depends on how we manage our open space, our water, and our traffic problems. Reporter Bob Evans sums up how all of these things are tied together. The water we drink, the air we breathe, the management of the land we work, play, and live on, the way we get where we're going. These are the issues we and our children face as Utah enters its 100th year of statehood. In 1896, when Utah entered the Union, it had approximately a quarter of a million people. Population projections for 1996 are near the 2 million mark, and the number is expected to leap to 2.2 million by the year 2000, when Utah takes center stage to host the Winter Olympics. The Olympics will be a defining moment as the world focuses on spectacular mountains, slick rock formations, open spaces, clean cities, and well-educated people. But will the world also see clogged freeways, polluted air and rivers, hundreds of homeless and protesting ranchers and environmentalists? That depends on the course we take in 1996. A key decision concerns transportation. All of us need to get where we're going, but it's getting tougher to do. Daily, we're presented with the horrific spectacle of fatal wrecks on overcrowded, under-maintained roads. Drivers' patience wears thin as more hours of the day are spent in stop-and-go traffic. Some support light rail as the answer. But will Utahns give up the freedom of a car at their immediate disposal? And will the rails run empty as many buses do now? In a state known for its wide open spaces, who will decide which land is preserved for recreation, wildlife, and farming, and which is developed into communities for our growing population? Will farmers and ranchers looking to cash out sell to the state or to developers? And what of the open spaces? Who will decide how and when they may be enjoyed? Each passing hunting season brings more incidents of hunters clashing with those who abhor the practice. Hikers are troubled by bikers. Cross-country skiers worry their backcountry woods will turn into alpine resorts. Water in the West is more precious than gold. Finding enough of it to drink, bathe in, water our crops, and accommodate new industry will take money. Keeping it clean will take vigilance. Well, we're about to wrap this up. Randy, do the folks in the audience have any strong feelings about what's the most important issues that we've talked about tonight? Yes, if you'll take a comment from one person who traveled from California when she had heard about this summit. Uh, what, what is your comment? Well, first I want to commend Governor Levitt for the, for the leadership and the others here. But, but the one thing I would like to... One thing I'd like to comment on, and it's not happening in, in any state, even in California, is we've, we're talking about single issues here, and I'd like to know how you're going to integrate these issues. As one person mentioned, that air quality has a lot to do with transportation. All of these issues are interconnected, and we need to manage them in that way. One way is through um, a shared information base, if you're going to have good decisions at the local level. And I'd like to know, you know, I would give a charge back to them how are, you know, to have a shared information base so that we can begin to integrate issues and integrate and have good decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got about 15 seconds for each point of view, I'm afraid. The Democratic point of view, Senator? 
Well, that's a great question. We believe that in this growth summit, crime and education have to be tied into it. We also believe, just as you so articulately said, that this is a bigger issue. We have to be able to go forward and share information through telecommunications. Technology is the key to success in the future. The more we can share that information and the greater paradigm shifts that we have as citizens of the state of Utah, the more success we're going to have. Okay, Mr. Ross. I think the key here is a cooperation based on trust, based on respect between local and state government. Something that we haven't had in all cases in the past. Something I look forward to out of this summit. Governor, do you want to sum it up? We should never lose sight of the fact that this is a golden era in Utah. We are in the process of being able to experience a remarkable period when our children will be better off. We have opportunities unparalleled. This is a beginning point, not an end. Uh, we'll begin tomorrow night and the next night, but literally for the next decade, this issue will dominate lo uh, politics, local and state, and it should because it's our heritage and we need to preserve it. Okay, well tonight we've uh, only scratched the surface, as, uh, as you mentioned, of, of these growth issues in Utah. We invite you to participate in the call-in programs on a radio station in your area immediately following this broadcast. You're invited to return to Cottonwood High School tomorrow night at 7 o'clock for another town meeting with Governor Levitt and many of these same policymakers. And we hope that you'll come here in person tomorrow or watch the summit on KUED Channel 7. You can also email your questions to the address you see on the screen, growthsummit at email.state.ut.us. And on Friday, you can join an online chat session with the governor at this internet address.